Today we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, the lost sheep parable. You think about it, every once in a while you lose something that you just know should be in a particular place. That's where I left it, I know it's there, and yet you can't find it. And you search, and you tear the place apart until you do find it. And even if it's something that's not particularly valuable, you spend all that time looking for it because, well, it's the principle of the thing. You, it's just not right when everything isn't the way it ought to be. And so that's Jesus picks up on that principle, that concept, and tells this story. Let's take a look. Luke chapter 15, 1 through 7. We'll start with verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let's pray. Lord, help us to see Jesus' side of it and not the religious side of it. Teach us through your word and help us to know how we ought to live for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This man welcomes sinners. Sinners is one of those words that's become an insult. Well, it's used as an insult here. It's not really an insult. It's a description. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Matter of fact, if you're human, you're a sinner. Okay? That's the way it works. So it's not, from God's point of view, an insult. It's a description. But let's take a look. Tax collectors and sinners are gathering, running to Jesus. I don't have a lot of that happening to me. Sinners don't come running up to me. Don, can I have lunch with you? Maybe I'm not as good as Jesus. Maybe that's what it is. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Or to put it another way, losers. Jesus appealed to losers. And by when I say it that way, what I mean is, every one of us has lost something. We've lost a relationship with God. We've lost uh, the ability. Don't you hate it when you keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again? And you lay there in your bed at night, you stare at the ceiling, and you go, what? I know that's dumb. Why do I keep doing that? That's because... We're fallen. We're not what we ought to be. Jesus appeals to that. <laughs> I like the insult there. Let me read that again. Uh, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Yes. Yeah. Jesus didn't allow sinners. He encouraged their fellowship. He sought them out. Because losers were willing to hear him out. They wanted to know what he had to say. Now, let me point something out here to you. In a world where you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you could have a stockbroker on this side of you and a mass murderer on this side of you and you wouldn't know the difference. You know, unless the murderer was all covered in blood and stuff. But, I mean, you just don't know. And we live in that kind of world and so it's kind of hard for us to grasp this accusation. He welcomes sinners. I, I met with one of the rabbis here locally, and we had a pretty good conversation. I said, well, we ought to go to lunch sometime. He said, no, I'm sorry, I can't eat. Now, don't go Pharisee on me. I mean, <laughs> calling him a Pharisee, and that's the way they think. That's the way they can, just can't eat with me. Sorry. That's the way it is. And it kind of gave me a little bit of insight into this. It's really a big deal. Now think about it this way, okay? Jesus one time said, you know, you shouldn't invite people that invite you to dinner to back over to your house. You should go out and find people that can't have any ability to pay you back with a meal and invite them to a meal. Well, okay, I understand the principle of that. But if you think about it, you don't invite someone to sit down to a meal that you don't know or care about. Normally. 
And every once in a while, you know, you see some poor guy sitting there when you walk out of Carl's Jr. and you go, hey, can I buy you a hamburger? That's kind of what Jesus is talking about. But normally, in a normal course of events, you eat with people you care about. Right? Especially if it's a party. Hey, let me go find some jerks. Invite them over to my house. No, you don't do that. You find family and friends and people you want to get to know. And it's a big deal that way. And all of that's involved in this. And so they're looking at Jesus and going, why would he sit down and eat with these people? They're not serving God. They're not like us. They're not being religious all the time. Well, Jesus appealed to leaders. But here's the other part of the problem. Religion appeals to winners. The Pharisees saw themselves as above the common herd. I'm not like that. What's that Pharisee prayer Jesus talked about? Thank God that uh, I didn't sin today, and I put a tithe in, and I did this, and I did that. I, God, you are just lucky to have me around. That's this attitude. And religion reinforces that attitude. When I say religion, I mean I'm going to do all these things and I'll be a good person and then God will have to accept me. That's religion. Jesus didn't come to teach religion. He came to teach you are fallen, you need a savior, trust me. That's different. Uh, Terry Taylor wrote a song uh, and he, in the song it says, clubs and cliques, they choose and pick and they make their interviews. Screen the undesirables and turn down clowns and fools. But Jesus died for sinners, losers, and winners. He died for all of us. He didn't just die for the bad people. He didn't just die for the good people. Because in God's eyes, all of us are fallen. The Pharisees thought they were above the common herd. But in fact, much of their religiosity was superficial. It was on the outside. It, it, it rules like this. This is my favorite. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Okay. Plowing would be working, right? So here's the ruling. If you drag your chair across the lawn, you're plowing because you're making furrows. But if you pick your chair up and carry it, you're not working. That's the kind of silly rule. It doesn't make any difference. It's just that's the rule. So we're going to go with the rule. And now I'm religious because I did this. When God sent Samuel to choose the new king, and he goes and he sees all of Jesse's sons, and he looks at him and he goes, Wow, this guy's a strapping hulk of a man. He must be the man God wants to choose. And God told Samuel several times, I rejected him. You look on the outside, but I look on the heart. You see, we can, and we all work at it, you know, to, to show this, this image to the world. But in fact, God sees beyond the image. And in fact, I'm, I'm really hard, hard pressed. I'm sorry to hurt your feelings. Most people see beyond your image. I mean, you can, first impressions are good, but after a while, people see third and fourth and fifth impressions, and they begin to see what I'm really like. And not just the image I want you to see. People look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. If Jesus is so great, why doesn't he associate with us decent, respectable folks? Well, he would if you wouldn't turn your nose up at him. That is not God's attitude, decent, respectable folks. Even if God says, you're a sinner, he doesn't then turn away and walk away from you. He says, oh, hey, sinner, you want to have lunch? <laughs> his attitude is not disapproving and looking down his nose at you. Matter of fact, let me give you God's attitude. When your child blows it, is your first reaction to write them out of the inheritance and never talk to them again? No, it's to whip their butt and then they're still your kid. That's closer to God's attitude than this turn up nose, walk away thing. Yeah, he disciplines us because he loves us. But we're still his kids. Paul said, Jesus Christ came in the world, into the world to save sinners, among whom I'm chief. Paul recognized it. 
if it's never happened to you, let me warn you that if you spend time with sinners, you're likely to be snubbed too. I've had that happen to me. What? Why were you spending time with those people? Don't you know that that will rub off on you and it will make you a bad person? I just know what Jesus is doing. Sorry. So, let's look at the parable. Because these people are looking at Jesus and going, Oh, look at him. He's eating with sinners and tax collectors. Well, I agree with the tax collector part. Verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. <coughs> Jesus hears these guys mumbling and who does he think he is? And why doesn't he just stay with decent folk? Why are we so sensible about everything but people? Why wouldn't God not care? We're his creation. Would he make us and then not care about us? And so Jesus tells them a parable, again, of something they would understand completely. A guy's got a flock of hundred sheep. Uh, they're out in the open. They're not in a sheep pen. They're out in the open country. And one of them wanders away. And by the way, sheep do that a lot. And so he leaves the ninety and nine out in the open country and goes and looks for the one sheep. Any responsible shepherd would do that. If you go out here in the fall, you can see them out on the hillside below the aqueduct. Uh, generally, every year, they got sheep out there eating up that weeds. I guess there's grass. Uh, but you watch them out there, and it's interesting to see how they do things. They do it differently. But in their culture, this is not a strange story. It's perfectly normal. They understand it. They get what's going on. Now, one of my favorite um, college jokes, school jokes, is these four graduate students. Uh, there's, a, there's an American, there's a Brit, there's a Frenchman, and there's a German. And they, they've enjoyed each other's company so much that they've decided that every year they want to get together again. And so every year they're going to pick a subject and they'll write about it and then come and present what they've written and that'll be their, their get-together thing. And so the first year, they choose the elephant for their subject. And the, uh, the British student shows up, and he's got his little monograph he's written on the family history of the elephant. The Frenchman shows up with a book he's written on the love life of the elephant. The American shows up with his book, 101 Uses for the Elephant. And the German shows up with his three-volume set, Introduction to the Elephant. <laughs> the Americans, you know, 101 use, what, what would an elephant, why would there be an elephant unless we could do something with it? It's got to be practical. We've got to, you know, got to be a prophet. We've got to do something. And so an American might look at this and go, wait a minute, hmm, 100 sheep, 99, 1, it's just not cost efficient to waste time going off to that one dumb sheep. It probably lost and broke a leg already. Anyhow, I mean, what is he? Some heartless, greedy one percenter capitalist? He's got to have that sheep. No, it's the principle of the thing. Even though the 99% are not in the sheepfold, they're in the open pasture, he leaves that whole flock to go after just one, just one lost one. Because, think about it, when it's incomplete, it's just not right. When an artist is painting a portrait, or a sculptor is sculpting, they often stop, they examine the symmetry, they look at it, they want to check the coloring, they want to check the expression, because in art, it's got to be just right, or it's not right at all. <coughs> <coughs> And apparently God has the same attitude. It's got to be just right. And so when he finds it, he comes back, and he doesn't just go, okay, back with the sheep. He carries it on his shoulder, and he tells all his friends, hey, I had a hundred sheep, I lost one, and now I've got it back, rejoice with me. 
True friends rejoice at another friend's completeness. Completeness. False friends just covet. Huh, I lost the sheep once and I didn't get it back. Remember last week, the parable of the workers in the field? You have made them equal with us. Some people just don't like that. I don't, I don't want that. I want, I gotta be higher. I gotta have more. I gotta be ahead. Otherwise, I'm not happy. God doesn't seem to have that attitude. Matter of fact, look at verse 7, because this seems to be God's attitude. I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. That's a relative thing, by the way, because we all need to repent. <coughs> but of course, some of us are way better than us. At least we'd like to think so. But God is like that shepherd. He's the artist who wants things to be just right. He's the God who looks after his own, not just sitting on a throne, throwing thunderbolts every once in a while, and making sure, hey, I saw you smiling, stop that. But he actually looks about after us. He cares for us. And when we wander off, he comes looking for us. And I, I've said this before, and I think it's really important to reiterate. We often talk about finding God. I, I think God has been looking for me before I found him. Matter of fact, God was hounding me before I found him. In Matthew's Gospel, we're reading Luke's Gospel here, Matthew's version of this story he sums it up this way. It's not the will of the Father that anyone should perish. So if you think God's waiting to judge you, you have the wrong attitude. God's waiting to find you. God's waiting to bring you in. God's waiting to rejoice over finding you. That's pretty cool as far as I'm concerned. Go out and find one sheep. Well, one is more than none. The angels in heaven rejoice over one person who turns to God more than 99 people who don't need to, who are already serving God. One conversion adds good to the world. It changes the equation of the whole world. It gives hope that God is working in the world and not just sitting somewhere on a throne on a cloud somewhere. But he, he's involved. He's part of what we're doing. He's working and moving to bring people in. And it also gives hope that maybe somebody else might turn. And so it's a good thing. There's rejoicing when a person turns to God. The Pharisees at the beginning of this story thought that there was rejoicing that they were so wonderful anyway. And, and let me tell you, it's very easy for us to fall into that. I go to church. I, I, I'm, I read my Bible all the time. I give money in the offering plate. Uh, God owes me. I'm a really wonderful person. And if I were to quit, then God would just be devastated. Well, yes, he would, but not for the reasons I might think. Now, I haven't sinned in 30 years, really. Really, I better check that attitude, I think. Some people only think they're part of the 99. I think the humility of it is to say, God, I need to turn to you again. That's what I like about God. He's the God of second, second chances and do-overs. And I think it's a good thing for us to be able to every day turn to him and say, let's start over fresh. Now, in this parable, the emphasis is on the fact of lostness. It is not upon the condition of the lost. It's easy to make a lot of assumptions, but like I said, parables only have a single point. And so the single point here is God cares for the lost and will look to find them. That's the point. It's not, well, this particular sheep was actually better than the other one that wandered off. It's not about the condition of the lostness. 
It's about when the lost are found, the owner rejoices. Because no matter what you or I might think of their condition, the owner, the shepherd, says that sheep has worth to me. And again, that's God's attitude to you and me. In the end, I would say, if you're going to make a point about Jesus, the shepherd is the one who suffered a lot more than the wandering sheep have. Because he's paid the price to bring them back. Let's pray.